Okay, today we're going to be talking uh, about personal car care from a elementary perspective. Uh, this is not so much for uh, mechanics as it is for people who are just interested in how to maintain their car. And I thought I would go ahead and cover some territory here. This is a rework of a seminar I did for uh, like about a dozen women that came uh, to a two hour night thing, but I don't think it's going to last us a couple of hours here. I'm going to try to move through this pretty quick. One of the things we need to make sure we do is we use common sense anytime we're working on a car. I don't know how many times I've seen people who are out there trying to jump off a car without any safety glasses on or anything. And if you touch those cables together over a battery that happens to be boiling and there's some explosive gas there, it's going to blow the battery up. I've had batteries blow up. Uh, and throw the plastic right at me. Now, one time I was taking a battery cable off uh, back in 1978 or 77 or whatever it was. And about the time I turned the, uh, my, made the first turn on the nut that on the battery cable, my arm happened to be in front of my face when that battery exploded and all that stuff hit me on the arm and none of it got to my face. And I'm just uh, saying, you know, you're, a lot of people jump off uh, vehicles and work around batteries without any eye protection. It's just not a good idea. Stay clear of moving parts. Don't have any loose clothing or necklaces. You don't want your head to have your hair tied back, ladies, if you're going to be working or long haired guys uh, with or long beards. Uh, make sure that that's back, tied back out of the way because these pulleys will grab a hold of that stuff and jerk you in there. Uh, don't ever pull the radiator cap off or a hose off when the cooling system's hot uh, because you can wind up getting into some serious trouble about that. Okay, so... Okay, never get underneath a jacked up vehicle unless it's properly supported, and that means with good jack stands, okay? All right, warning indicators, fluids, all coolant, and other stuff. Okay, the check engine, the service engine, soon light, and all that. We're going to uh, be talking about that a little bit later at the end. Um, but you need to figure out, uh, make sure that you know where your engine oil dipstick is your transmission fluid if it has one a lot of them don't have a transmission dip, dipstick now and then make sure that you know how to pour coolant in there where to put it where to stop when to stop pouring it this one lady came uh, to uh, the school out there she was somebody that was in her 40s and I thought she was pretty sharp but she said her uh, engine was low on oil or apparently she had a low oil light come on or something and so she took that uh, oil filler cap off and she kept pouring oil in there until she couldn't get any more in there. It was full all the way to the top of the engine. And it just blew me away that she did that and then drove the car over there. It's amazing how much they, that will, I, you know, just, ah, it was awful. There was, we had to drain it you know, about seven or eight quarts of oil to get it down to five quarts. It was an old 92 Buick, if I remember right, with a V6. But the simple fact is you got your power uh, steering fluid that needs to be looked at. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then you got your warning lights and stuff. All right, so fluids and oils come in a variety of different colors for a reason. Leak detection is easier whenever you're looking at the color of the fluid that's on the ground. Uh, most transmission fluid, if it's new, is going to be a sort of a reddish color like you see here. Uh, but there are, if, if the fluid, I have seen in some of the Cadillacs and stuff that would have a lot of miles on the transmission fluid, the fluid would be a lot darker colored than that to the point of almost looking like old brake fluid or something, which I thought was weird on the 105 Cadillac I saw. Uh, power steering fluid is really important. Um, coolant, uh, you know, and it's, it's a clear fluid, by the way, but it can't, it will usually turn dark after it has been cycled a bit through the system. Uh, so you may wind up having to look and see what's low if you see something on the ground and you check all your fluid levels. The one that's low is typically the one that's leaking if the leak is very bad. Uh, you got green antifreeze. You got this uh, orange antifreeze. You got yellow antifreeze. And I, you can call it coolant, you know. But uh, that's a uh, bunch of different colors of coolant you got. Most of your, these are the foreign cars will take this uh, oddball color here washer fluid uh, it's a good idea not to mix the different types of washer fluid because sometimes that will cause them to turn to jelly and will clog up the jets on your windshield washer uh, and then brake fluid is typically going to start out clear when it's new and then it's going to get dark uh, when it's older okay so all right this is uh basically it's a real 
you know, concise oil gallery. This is a 7.3 power stroke, obviously, but the point is the galleries are very similar. The power stroke does have some oil jets under the pistons to keep the pistons cool, but the, there's this oil goes through these galleries in, and it's pressurized. Uh, there is an oil pressure, uh, there's a relief valve that makes this positive displacement pump whenever it's filling that gallery up the little relief valve moves enough to where it regulates the pressure at 40 or 50 pounds or whatever if the relief valve ever stuck closed it would just about blow the oil filter slam off the car uh, which i've you know known of that happening before when the relief, relief valve is stuck but the oil is drawn in through this through here okay it's drawn in through here into the pump and that pump is the way it's fixed that's a gyrotor style pump there a lot of oil pumps are driven by the camshaft. This one happens to be driven by the crankshaft, which is becoming fairly common, but they're configured in a lot of different ways. Uh, back in the day, the distributor had a shaft going down through there. The distributor was driven by the camshaft, and the distributor also had a, a rod coming off that drove the oil pump, but the oil pump can be driven any kind of way as long as it pumps oil. Uh, that's the important part. Now, the familiar SAE designations, uh, such as OW. 5W, 10W, 15W, 30, 40, whatever. They refer to the viscosity of the oil at a specific temperature. W stands for winter. And everybody that you talk to about that will just about try to convince you that stands for weight, but that's not what that's talking about. W stands for winter. You can look that up if you want to. All right, the lower the W numbers, the easier the engine spins over in cold ambient temperatures. And that's really important, particularly in the northern part of the if, if imagine uh, if you've ever tried to uh, stir cold molasses or syrup or anything like that or honey, you know, you can imagine how that's going to try to slow it down. It's going to cause more uh, uh, starter current and there's all kinds of issues with that. And furthermore, once it does start, if that oil flows too quickly, it may be slow filling up that oil gallery. And that oil gas, you know, you may wind up with your camshafts and stuff spinning in dry saddles until it gets up. So you want it to flow quickly up through there and and so that not just so that it won't slow the crankshaft down, but so it'll fill the oil gallery up quicker and get everything lubricated faster. All right. Now, lubrication property, you got cooling property, you got stress load bearing property. This is a different thing, parts of oil. Contaminant suspension property. All of those are elements of oil. Uh, it's supposed to suspend contaminants so they don't settle into the bottom and settle into the places. And, you know, when they build up enough, they can cause all kinds of problems. And so lubrication property is also important, but it also cools. And it, it's basically supposed to help bear the load that's on the bearing by putting an oil film in between the bearing and the crankshaft and so on and so forth. And there, that's, that's all. There's, there's also something that wasn't included on this slide is there's a detergent property. Uh, to oil and all that. Now the, the uh, synthetic oils are basically just formulated in the laboratory and all of this is uh, factored in whenever they're making it. Uh, whenever they take regular oil, petroleum based oil, and they add all of these uh, chemicals and stuff to it, that's what makes the oil uh, what it is and changes the properties of it and all that. The uh, diesels have to have, the, especially the ones you use oil to operate the injectors, have to have an anti-foaming agent put in them so that if, if the oil won't foam so it can operate the injectors without turning into uh, this you know foamy froth. Uh, the API rating, this is the Institute's uh, registered trademark for engine oil classification. And you notice these letters, of, the higher these go, uh, these uh, letters go up to see how they get uh, better and better as they go. Uh, basically, the S is always, and I'll show you that in a minute, the S is always something you're going to see on a spark-fired engine. And uh, C is a compression fired engine, fired engine. This actually, this one here will work on either one. Compression, compression fired would be diesel. Spark fired would be gasoline. Okay, so the farther you go, uh, the higher this uh, second letter is, uh, the more qualities the oil has. You notice these are obsolete. And these are badly obsolete, can cause equipment harm. So if you use really, really old oil, you know, like for these really old cars and newer cars, you can damage the newer car. Uh, and that's really important, particularly on gasoline direct injection vehicles. There's some uh, elements of that engine that are extremely in extreme need of uh, lubrication. Because uh, if you use the wrong kind of oil, you can basically destroy the camshaft and uh, stuff like that. Cause you all kinds of problems. That's another thing, though. 
All right, so if you break this down, 4 is anti-foaming. That's for a diesel, like I was talking about. Uh, C is compression fired, uh, like a diesel. Uh, spark ignition is what this S stands for. And these are the, this is the little donut you see on the side of the can. You see that? Now, though, in the middle, this is your SAE, Society of American Engineers. This is American Petroleum Institute uh, classification. So that know what you're looking at when you look at that oil. Um, there was a lot of... Uh, people that used uh, Quaker State oil back in uh, the early years whenever I was in working at filling station. And that was generally regarded to be a good oil. Some people uh, tried to push the notion that Quaker State oil would cause your uh, engine to um, sludge up, but that was a bunch of hogwash. That's not a Quaker State oil thing. It basically is because people weren't letting their vehicles get warm enough when they'd start them, and they would make little short uh, trips to the store and all that. Now, the underhood vehicle emission control decal sometimes, but not always, lets you know what oil to use. Typically, you're going to uh, have it uh, on the oil filter filler cap, you know, your SAE number anyway, and it's always in the owner's manual. And now, see, so you notice the API is not here, but they do have the SAE. But look at this. Uh, this right here says, this is kind of confusing. Use SAE 5W30 American Petroleum Institute certified oils. See, <laughs> you basically really need to know a little more than you're told right here. And this was on a 98 Ford Ranger, by the way. Uh, so the, that uh, winter grade there is is not, I mean, it's, it's important. Uh, and believe it or not, 0W oils are a little thicker than 5W oils. And so, put you know, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Um, Nowadays, SA information is on the oil filler cap. Consult the owner's manual, though, or ask the parts counter person if you have trouble finding it because the parts person can tell you if you know your, uh, your model and your engine size and all that stuff uh, that, that, of your vehicle. It, they will be able to look it up at the parts house and tell you which oil is supposed to go in there. And, they, and you know, you can typically, at most of these parts stores now, they will have the OE oil, like Motorcraft or, or whatever, you know. All right, the oil filter does the job like our kidneys do. It sort of like, you know, filters the oil. The oil pumps the heart of the engine that moves the oil. They're drawn through this tube. It's got a screen at the coarse end. If you've got sludge and crud down there in the bottom of that pan because you've not changed your oil like you should or used the wrong oil or you've driven it too far, uh, you know, you've driven it too many times without letting it warm up or, or whatever, you know, that bothers me about used car lots because they move the, they crank the cars up. They move them to a different place when they're shuffling the cars around. They don't let them warm up because they don't want to have to pay for all that gas. And who knows how much sludge is in there. Whenever we would get an engine that we were going to swap out, whenever I was uh, t teaching over there and we would get an engine to swap out, I'd always have the students pull the valve cover and the oil pan off and see how much sludge was there. And if there was a heck of a lot of sludge there, we would have to try to desludge it as good as we could because a lot of the times that sludge gets up in here and it just kind of sits there until you go on a long trip and then that sludge starts to melt and run down in the pan. Then it can clog up the screen. Then it can starve it for oil. Then it can burn the engine up. Uh, I knew this one guy that bought a 93 uh, grandma and grandpa car that was an Acura and uh, he was really happy that he got that car. And the first time he drove it on a trip that was longer than a couple of hundred miles, he was about halfway back. And that sludge washed out of all around in here and got down in that pan. And it stopped up that screen and destroyed the engine. That was rough. All right. Spin-on versus cartridge type filters. You know, you got these right here. The cartridge type filter will usually come with the O-rings and stuff. And you need to put those on there and all that. And uh, I kind of like these. They're not quite as messy as these. Uh, some guys, whenever they're doing this, if they're a, a, an oil change person, they'll go ahead and punch a hole in that and let the oil run out of that filter first into the pan, and then they'll screw the filter off. When you put it back on, when you take that oil filter off, if you're doing this yourself, you better find out where this gasket is. If you don't know where that thing is, you better find it, because if it's stuck to that surface that seals the oil, it's going to double gasket, and then you're going to possibly have a massive oil leak and an engine destruction issue. So always find this. Just make sure you know where this gasket is after you screw the filter off. And then put you some oil on here. You know, wipe off the surface up there that it seals against. Put you some oil on here with your finger because your finger's washable, you know. And then screw that thing up there and tighten this filter by hand. You don't need to tighten a ever-loving crud out of it with a filter wrench. That uh, seal is going to swell up a little bit and seal a little better anyway, 
after you put it on there. And that's one of the reasons that some filters, even if they were put on by hand, are so tight and hard to take off because that seal swells up and it makes it tighter and all. Now, there's your, you got a bypass valve built into that filter. All right, now that bypass valve is basically going to be the, uh, the one that, uh, if the oil filter is stopped up, that bypass valve opens up and lets oil, dirty oil is better than no oil. So it lets the, the oil, if it, instead of, if it can't go through a clogged up filter, it lets it go past the filter through that spring, uh, you know, pushes down and it'll let it put, bypass the filter and go lubricate the engine, which is really important. And so that's just a little quickie on that. Now, your car doesn't feel pain, so it needs to be able to tell us when something's wrong. If something we can't detect in the way, if it runs or drives. I have heard people say, I say, when did you have an oil change? They say, well, I hadn't changed the oil because it still runs okay. Well, that's scary because, you know, a lot of the times until it starts knocking, you didn't even know you had a problem if you're not paying attention to your oil. Watching warning indicators and gauges, that's there for a reason. Pay attention to them and have your car checked if a gauge or an indicator breaks its normal pattern of behavior. You need to be knowing what those things are supposed to look like, you know, where the gauges are supposed to read and how they're supposed to, how the transmission uh, is shifting can be told by looking at your tack and your vehicle speed. And you can tell if you get used to watching it, uh, how that's going to work. All right. You keep your oil checked and changed. Now, assuming five quarts of oil in an engine will last 3000 miles. And this is old numbers. I understand four quarts in that same engine will break down in about 1500 miles, believe it or not. That's published by one of the OEMs that I read some material by vehicles that use full synthetic oil, though, usually hold more oil and they have longer oil change intervals. OK, you check your engine oil with the engine switched off, pull the stick, wipe it, reinsert it, pull it again. The engine doesn't have to be warm to do this. You can check it at any temperature. That's different from the transmission. The transmission fluid is going to expand and contract. Transmission fluid and engine coolant expand and contract with heat. Uh, the engine oil, not so much. It pretty well stays the same. Okay, so when you hold the dipstick, hold it with the tip down instead of up because you don't want the oil running up the stick, making you think you got more oil than you have. And so some causes of engine killing sludge, like I talked about, using the wrong oil, neglecting oil changes, running the engine too cold, frequent short drives, PCV system failure can cause it. Some of the uh, 99, 2000 model Toyota engines had a PCV system that didn't quite work right. And that was that caused them to have sludge problems so that the engine, uh, if, as a matter of fact, if you've got one that sludged up this bad and it has started causing problems, most of the time the re recommendation is not to get rid of this sludge, but to replace the engine. So sludge can be an engine killer. Now be really careful about that. Always make sure you warm the car up before you switch it off. And if it's running too cold for whatever reason, that needs to be fixed. All right, get into the transmissions here. The purpose of a transmission is to amplify or and modify the force of the engine's rotational power called torque and transfer it to the vehicle's drive axle. That's just what it's there for. Transmissions use a different kind of oil, obviously, than engines, but the oil level and service intervals go by different rules. Transmission fluid expands when hot. So if you check the transmission fluid, even when the engine running, even if you've run it through the gears, if you check it when it's cold, it's liable to be uh, low. It's liable to read low when it's not. You're going to have to, now, a lot of them will have a, a low range, I mean a cold range and a hot range on the dipstick. So pay attention to which one of those ranges you're looking at. And in order to have the engine, uh, if you've got a warm engine, that doesn't mean the transmission's warm. You're going to have to warm the transmission up, you know, by driving it. Uh, before you can get the transmission all warm enough to be certain. Now you can, if you've got a scan tool, you can look at the transmission oil temperature sometimes and uh, take care of that. Okay, now the check transmission fluid. Again, the transmission's got to be warm with the engine running and idle, park or neutral. Pull the dipstick if it's got one, wipe it, reinsert it, and pull it out and read it again. The bottom of the crosshatch indicates a half a quart low on transmission dipsticks. Not a full quart, but a half quart. Sometimes the dipstick will tell you what kind of fluid to use. If you put too much transmission fluid in a transmission, it can foam and it can cause issues on some of the little 3T40Es, I think that's right, name nomenclature in these GM cars. If you put too much transmission fluid in there, it will make it feel like the catalytic converter stopped up and it won't hardly go. Uh, so make sure that the fluid is the right. Now, those don't have a dipstick either, that 3T40E that I was talking about. So that's real easy. Sometimes people just figure too much transmission fluid is better than not enough, so we'll pour a whole bunch in there. Transmissions without dipsticks are getting more and more prevalent. Some of the newest ones don't have 
dipstick so you might not be able to check your own fluid level there in the driveway check your owner's manual be sure but even on those you still got to have the transmission at a certain temperature and you there's a procedure you have to go through but i'm not going to go into all that right now if your transmission doesn't have a dip, dipstick you're just about going to have to get it uh, serviced somewhere today's transmissions are computer controlled and will usually flash illuminate or flash the overdrive light or illuminate a service vehicle soon light which is slightly different from service engine soon light some 2000 Tauruses have got a transmission warning light like the one on, you see up here on the left. You know, that's a that's a Taurus thing. Uh, the overdrive light, though, if it's flashing, then there's some there's going to be some kind of a code stored in there. Good one more time. All right. And so here's your brake fluid. I was adding that brake fluid in a video I made a while back, but that's a little brake fluid slide. Most cars use dot three, but dot four will work. Dot five is silicone based and prone to foam. And it will cause trouble in anti-lock brake systems. Now, don't be intimidated by the not, not, dot number. Just ask the parts guy for brake fluid. And if you tell them what kind of car you got, they'll know what kind they, to give you. Uh, dot 3 is most common, but dot 4 is gaining in popularity due to the widespread use of anti-lock brake systems. And they benefit from a lower viscosity fluid, which is what dot 4 is. Uh, brake warning light indicators. You can engage your park brake and see this light right here. Um, but the... Uh, anti-lock system if there's a problem in the ABS system it will turn this light on too a lot of times but there's several reasons this light can come on uh, just like there's several reasons this light will come on this light right here can come on and not have anything to do with this however if this light comes on the ABA system ABS system may be uh, disabled and so uh, but you still got your regular brakes right so if there's a concern detected in the ABS system, low fluid pressure problem will turn that light on and cause this one to come on. No anti-lock function with that light illuminated. All right, so power steering, you notice right here, you got electric power steering and there are several different configurations of that. I just put this one up here, these little uh, motors right here. You got little brushless uh, DC motors that operate those and little worm gears and everything. And, and they got a little torque sensor up in here so that it, the little module that operates this knows which way to help you turn it. Uh, but rack and pinion is the kind that's most prevalent nowadays. You almost never see any of the old recirculating ball stuff like you used to see on the older cars. Uh, but uh, many of today's vehicles have got electric power steering rather than the hydraulics, and that's more and more common. Uh, power steering fluid is what you need to use as much as possible. Years ago, a lot of the times, we would just pour automatic transmission fluid in there, like Type F automatic transmission fluid or something. But there's a lot of different ATF formulas, so be really careful. Uh, the pair of power steering pump is pulled by a belt, and if the belt slips, the steering may not be totally powered. Use winter washer fluid during cold months so the washer fluid won't freeze and burst the reservoir. Furthermore, if you got ice on your windshield and you're using some really good winter washer fluid, you'll wind up being able to get most of that ice off your windshield. Now, I'm talking about this heavy stuff with the snow and all, but in the deep south here, if it gets down below 30 degrees or so, we're going to have frost on our glass. And, uh, you know, I, you can also keep a uh, spray bottle with some uh, alcohol in it out there in your vehicle. You want it to be out there in the vehicle so it's cold and it's the same temperature as the <coughs> as everything else. And you can spray that on your windshield and get rid of the ice too because uh, alcohol will melt ice. But it's best to use the washer fluid because you sit down in the car and you wee like that and then hit, hit it a few times with this uh, cold weather washer fluid. And there you go. Now you see a washer fluid light that's not really a big deal if your washer fluid light comes on get a gallon of good washer fluid but here's the thing try to use the same kind consistently because i'm telling you if you mix the different types of washer fluid then they'll chemically react with one another and they'll turn into jelly and they'll clog up those jets i mean i don't know how many times i've had to straighten that out and so in my vehicles i like to use the same kind of washer fluid all the time uh, without swapping around and just getting random washer fluid or something Coolant should be changed according to OEM specs. There's all-in-one coolants available that work pretty good. Mix with distilled water 50-50 or buy it already mixed. Uh, if you don't mix it with distilled water, I knew this one guy that mixed some plain old tap water uh, with refrigerant. And, I mean, not with refrigerant, but with coolant. And it turned into some sort of uh, slushy mess sitting in his garage. He was just horrified by that. That's why you use the distilled water, which you can buy for about a dollar a gallon over at the grocery store. And pour that in there and uh, mix it with your uh, uh, coolant, what I'm talking about. 
pure coolant will turn to gel at about eight below zero. So if you put pure, pure coolant in there with no water, you're, you're liable to damage your engine if it gets very cold. Uh, coolant system issues. You got a water pump here. This this little thing spins next to a reaction surface. You notice the reaction surface on this one is built on the pump. This one here is basically going to be on the cover that this bolts into. Um, if the rust melts these, or if for some reason or other these melt away so that there's too much space between the impeller and the reaction surface, the pump won't be efficient. Uh, and it's fairly common for uh, sledged up systems like this one. You see me hold, that's my hand there. Uh, if you see sludge and crud in there, uh, it slowly begins to eat away at the impeller. And a lot of times you may wind up with one that's overheating or maybe we have had them where they weren't overheating, but the heater wouldn't work because there wasn't any fluid being, uh, I mean, coolant being pumped through the heater core because the blades were worn off to the point of where they just weren't doing it. There's a swollen hose. This was on a uh, 87 Pontiac that I used for a trainer car. And I was, had that thing was running really good and hot. And that hose was swelled up like that. If that thing had busted and sprayed hot coolant all over me, I'd have got third degree burns. I shut it off. I let the pressure go away. And after the pressure went away, I replaced that hose. But that is pretty darn spooky. Now you got cooling fans that are driven by the engine or by electric motors and the engine controller will turn those on typically you know some of the older vehicles would have a little thermostatic um, switch that was screwed into the radiator like on the old Volkswagen rabbits and stuff that would turn the fan on but those like to burn out typically these will have a relay and um, a relay will drive these fan motors and GM or Ford uh, a lot of the times they'll have both of these fans running and like if whenever the fans are needed to run on low, it'll have both of them running at half speed. In other words, they'll be running in series so that each one's only getting six volts. And if they want it to run faster, they can make them run both the full speed, you know, by using the, they, they got a couple of switches and some relays. And I, I used to teach my students how to wire that up on a board that I built and all that. But anyway, it can run one fan or the other fan. Uh, or it can run both fans low or both fans high, depending on the thing. And some of the uh, vehicles, like some of your uh, Sonata um, Hyundais, will have a special fan module. Uh, the Nissans have got uh, complicated looking fans because each motor has got four terminals going to it and all that. And that's another story. That surge tank is really important. One of my students had a cracked surge tank on his Power Stroke diesel. And I said, this cracked surge tank, you can get another one. They got them in stock at the parts store for that vehicle for 48 bucks. He didn't want to spend the money. Two or three days later, that surge tank lost enough of his refrigerant that it, uh, not refrigerant, I'm sorry, coolant, that it destroyed his engine. And so that was an $18,000 repair. Belts and hoses. You know, whenever you're pulling a belt off, if you don't have this on the radiator shroud or somewhere where you can access it, of course, a lot of times you can Google stuff on your phone, you need to take a really careful look at how that belt is routed and draw you a picture on a sticky note or something. <clears throat> what you don't want is to get the belt off in your hand and not know how to put it back on there. And that is really important that you know how it goes back. Now, this one here even tells you which way to go with your tensioner and all that. So most of these tensioners are spring loaded. I'll talk more about that in a minute. These clamps right here are a little bit annoying. They're not usually a problem, although occasionally one of these clamps, when it gets old, will break and it'll let the hose get loose. A lot of this coolant, now that you notice this is a plastic radiator, if you've got a really high mileage vehicle, you might want to consider getting a good radiator to replace it with just because that's, a radiator can split uh, without warning and destroy an engine. It doesn't happen a lot, but it can. I've seen it a few times. And, uh, but just think about that. you got hot coolant going through that plastic. That's something you need to be thinking about. Now, the belts and hoses. Belts ought to be replaced if the pulley side of the belt's cracked or polished in appearance. Now, that's on, this is a V-belt. Now, V-belts are almost nowhere anymore, right? Usually, belt route and schematics can be found under the hood of the vehicle. That's what I was talking about a minute ago. Multi-groove belts. These right here, you need to change those more regularly than you think because they start tend to wear out. And they're supposed to be fit in that pulley so that water, when it gets in there, can be uh, channeled out of there. When that belt starts to wear a little bit, and there's belt wear tools you can get. They usually, they have them sometimes that the parts has to give you one. Uh, but, you know, don't quote me on that. But, they, you know, but, uh, Gates and, and Daco have belt, uh, uh, I mean, belt gauges, you know, where you can actually measure to see if the belt's worn out bad enough. Uh, when in doubt, you know, get a belt put on there. Now, belts aren't typically that hard to change. 
this one friend of mine had a 5.3 liter in an 07 Chevy truck, and he was over at the Chevy place getting an oil change done, and they were trying to change him $250 to change his belts. It's not worth that much money to change a belt. He went and bought $30 worth of belts, and we did it in my driveway in about 15 minutes. So, you know, use your head when you're going to that. You don't have to pay a massive amount of money to get belts swapped out. And all that. Sixth, so, check right, the tensioner so, arm motion. All right, look at this. With the engine running, see how much the arm is moving back and forth. If that it's arm supposed is moving. like that then you got a tensioner that needs to be replaced and that's the you do, there's parts of that tensioner that will wear out that you can't see you know there's a damper in there and a bushing and some more stuff and they're down inside that uh, part that it pivots on and when that starts to wear out it's going to be bouncing a lot and that's hard on all your other accessories and sometimes you'll get chirping and squeaking noises and all that kind of stuff the the video that is the most uh watched on my youtube channel is the one about a noisy belt tensioner all right, there's your warning indicators. Uh, coolant level light's going to look like a little radiator. They may say something like low coolant. Temperature warning indicators usually look like a thermometer with its lower tip immersed. Or they may say temp on them. Then you've got, you know, just pay attention to that. These are a funny warning indicator. You can pause the video and read these. That's, I thought that was very comical. I don't know who put that together, but I got it online somewhere. It was just really funny. Uh, the camshaft and on timing belts, camshaft operates the valves. They have to be timed to open and close with the strokes of the pistons for the engine to work right. For that engine, the, cam, the reason the camshaft's got to be in time with the engine. All right, so you've got to have this thing in time. These cannot be out of time with one another because those valves enable that, it, that the engine to breathe. The engine's a, basically a breathing machine. And timing belt, if you got it, you want to look at the whole thing, look like that. This one here pulls the water pump, see, which is very interesting. If you're having to replace the timing belt, always feel of that tensioner, feel of that water pump, see if it needs a water pump and or a tensioner while you're there. As a matter of fact, some of the kits you buy from the parts stores will come with a water pump and a tensioner and a belt. And so they, they're getting pretty good about uh, putting together those little kits like that, or you can just buy the timing belt. Some timing belts, if they jump, will bend valves and mess the engine up. Uh, if it's on a little Kia or something, if one of those jumps, a uh, little four-cylinder Kias, will, a lot of those engines will bust the heads off the valves and destroy the engine big time. And so you don't want to ignore the ch change interval, the OEM's interval for changing the timing belt. Now, Toyota Camrys, like 2.2s, they won't bend valves. Mitsubishis will just about always bend valves when they jump. And so just, you know, let your conscience be your guide on that. One time this uh, a girl came in there to have some work done on her little, uh, some kind of little SUV that she had that had timing belts on it. And I could hear the timing belt slapping the timing cover. And I said, that timing belt really needs to be replaced. And uh, she said, okay, well, I'll bring it back tomorrow. And so I bought a timing belt ready for her to come back so we could put a timing belt on it. She never came back. And she told me later, she said a month after she decided not to come back, her timing belt jumped, bent all the valves, or a bunch of them, and she had to have a $1,500 valve job done to straighten that mess out. Uh, so, well, 60,000 miles was a real common interval years ago. Now some of them go for 100,000 miles without a timing belt. You know, your, your manual will tell you. Uh, you know, that's how you can look. Uh, find out what it costs to have the job done and budget for it, right? You may not be able to put the timing belt on yourself, but, you know, it's a lot smarter to decide when the belt gets changed because it's not going to pick a good time to slip. And, and they will do that over time. You know, those belts wear it down. All right, this is a, this one doesn't use a belt. Uh, it has a, it's got to have these gears. You notice the crankshaft gear is half the size of the camshaft gear because the crankshaft turns twice as fast as the camshaft. And so that's basically a little picture I put on there. Uh, you know, typically those right here, you know, they don't usually fail, although some of them uh, year, years ago had phenolic gears that would, uh, they were so it would be quieter and they wouldn't rattle uh, because of the uh, camshaft gets hard and easy and hard and easy when you're turning it and it will make it lash noises. And so they would 
some of the Chevrolets, the old 2.2 Chevrolet cast iron block engines would have a, a phenolic gear and that gear would bust off. The old V6 Mustang or mid 70s Mustang engines, uh, they were fixed the same way. Uh, that was pretty rough how some of those would, they would just bust those phenolic gears off. Now, I've never, I never saw any of those bend valves, uh, but and it's amazing to me that they didn't. But uh, typically, the gear that you'd put back on there would be a metal gear instead of one of the phenolic gears, you know, just so you wouldn't cause it lose it again. Now, manual transmission oil has no warning indicators. There's no warning indicators on a manual transmission. Uh, most manual transmissions don't have any kind of an oil pump. They just basically use splash oil. Uh, there may be some. I know transfer cases have an oil pump. I don't mention transfer cases much in here. Uh, but the four-wheel drive people that have done transfer case work know that a transfer case has got an oil pump. But a manual transmission, unless some of the newer ones that I'm not aware of have it, they don't typically have an oil pump. Uh, they will have some little troughs and stuff that will catch oil and funnel it down here and some of the bearings and all that. They, they be careful. But run, running a manual transmission out of fluid will destroy the gears and the bearings in short order. Typically, the first one that suffers is the input shaft and its bearing. Uh, and that's just the way it is, you know. Differential oil is typically heavier uh, oil. Uh, the, the, some of it uh, is, the, some of the differentials require synthetic oil that's really expensive to go in them. Uh, and there's, if you have a limited slip differential, which will have clutches between these side axle gears and, uh, and their uh, surface behind them, uh, they will have to have uh, some uh, friction modifier so that they don't chatter when you're going around a curve. Uh, rear axle oil is, is used on rear wheel drive and four wheel drive vehicles. Almost never needs changing. Uh, trans, transaxle fluid on some transaxles requires automatic transmission fluid, believe it or not, for a manual transaxle on some vehicles. But you need to make sure you're putting the right kind in there. Because if you don't, you're going to have issues. I put some oil one time in a Toyota transmission that I rebuilt on a little Toyota Corolla back in 72. You know, that was your model of it. Up this, this was in like 1977 or something. That was a cool little transmission. It opened up like a suitcase. You know, you could take all these bolts off, open it up, and you're looking at the gears. And uh, But I put, uh, all I had on hand was some 140 weight gear oil, and I put it in there. And everything was fine except the I had gear clash every time I shifted gears. So I had to drain that out of there and put some different oil in there. But this oil needs to be checked. Protect. There's no dipstick. Uh, you pull the, you know, there's a, uh, typically on the, on this housing up here about halfway up. Either back here on a Dodge, you'll have a rubber plug you can pull out. It ought to be right at the base of that hole. And on the Chevrolets and the Fords, it'll be coming in the side and the front part of that and all that kind of stuff. <coughs> Drive axles are a big thing. You notice that uh, on this one here, this the design of this illustration is that they tried to make these drive axles as close to the same length as they could. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute if I don't forget it. Uh, but basically what you're looking at is this snaps into the transmission or transaxle rather, the differential. In other words, that's going to go uh, into those uh, side axle gears in there. And a lot of, like my Explorer has got an aluminum housing and it's got CV axles going out to hubs like this. So it's got this fairly common even on rear wheel drive vehicles. And this this one right here though uh, came out is is a front one because this this turns a lot sharper. It'll go for a real sharper angle than the uh, the one in the back, which is basically that one plunges in and out, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't flex a whole lot. It can flex some, but that's basically this would be if on one that where you're going to be turning the wheels. Uh, that's the one. It's got they call it a constant velocity joint, a CV joint, because a regular U-joint, whenever you bend it too sharp, gets hard and easy and hard and easy. A sinus of velocity joint has got balls and channels, and you can turn it really sharp, and it's providing the same amount of torque at any angle. Now, the purpose of the transmission is to modify the force of the engine's rotation and transfer it to the drive shaft, drive axle through a drive shaft. That's why the drive shaft got these little, some of them will have two of these. We know one here and another one right next to it set up so that it'll act like a constant velocity joint. These and the uh, drive axles I showed you in the previous slide have got to plunge when the suspension works, and that's why you have them like that. So it can basically get longer and shorter while it's still transmitting torque. All right, keep the fluid checked. 
and changed. Affects any leaks as soon as possible. No jackrabbit starts. More frequent service of automatic transmissions when you're pulling heavy loads. Tell your technician about any clicking or popping noises and when they happen. Typically, worn out outer CV axles will click and pop when you're turning. Like click, 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 click when you're turning. <coughs> and uh, they will, if you've got busted boots on those, dirt and sand and grit will get in there and wear them out a lot quicker. There's your tires, your wheels, and your alignment. You can freeze this slide and you can look at that. You can break down the way this works. See uh, what those num what those mean. That's really important to look at that and understand what you're looking at. Uh, and and this is telling you if you look at this very carefully, it tells you uh, how all that's figured. You know, basically your section height and your section width and so on and so forth. There's your section width. Is this is 205 millimeters, and then your section the aspect ratio is basically how much of a percentage of this that this is you see so this right here will be a percentage of this uh, and that's basically how you're going to be looking at that section height over section width is basically what you're looking at there so uh, this is 75 percent as tall as it is wide if that makes any sense whenever it's inflated and then here's your little your angles you know camber uh, outside wear on the shoulder, so on and forth. That's basically giving an idea of what camber does, you know. And uh, all tire manufacturers say to keep the best tires on the rear. That sounds crazy. A lot of your old mechanics will argue with you about that, but all you got to do is tell them, go look on Michelin and uh, all of these other places that make tires. I don't care who they are. And just see what they say about if you're only putting two tires on there, where do you need to put them? For years, we put them on the front because we felt like they needed to cut the water and all that. But really, they need to be on the rear because it keeps it from spinning out and crashing. If you've got tires that are, are largely worn on the rear and new tires on the front, you're liable to spin out this way. And there have been shops that lost uh, lawsuits over that because they took the old tires on the back, they spun out and they hit a tree and wrapped around it and damaged somebody really bad. Now that's what you call oversteer. Whenever it, it does, the you know, the angle changes more than you meant for it to and it slides off. This right here is understeer. Like if you got really, really bad, slick, worn out front tires and you're going around a slick curve, you're liable to keep going straight even though you meant to turn. That's called understeer. It's when the car misses the curve. Make sure your tires have not expired. More than six years old is basically a uh, when they're out of warranty. Now, I will tell you that there are some tire makers that will tell you the tires are, are safe for about 10 years, but they will not do anything about replacing them, even if they look like a brand new tire, if they're six years old. The problem of this, or if they're six years old or older, the problem is the spare tire, if it's a full-size spare that's under the car or in the trunk or wherever, may be... If the vehicle's over 10 years old, you may have a dreadfully unsafe tire. This was one of my students that had this 88 uh, Blazer. And his tires, if you look at those, look really good. But they were badly over 10 years old. And he was driving along, and one of the tires just came apart. And he flipped that thing over and totaled it out. Because although the tires looked good, uh, one of them came apart suddenly like that. And that's what I'm talking about. Now, if you want to look at that, sometimes this will be facing the inside on your tire and you might not be able to find it because it's facing in uh, but uh, uh, you know a tire store if, if they will you can say put the date codes to the outside if you don't mind when you're mounting my tires the the ninth week of 2018 is what this means 0918 that is telling you how old this particular tire here is but you can look online and find more information about tire codes you know that's not a bad idea to educate yourself on that Tires, wheels, and alignment, you know, tire pressure, you got to keep it checked. A tire can be half flat and still look like it's okay by just glancing at it. And so they do make some fancy little uh, uh, valve stem caps you can put on there that will change color whenever the pressure gets too low. But just about all vehicles now have got uh, <coughs> tire pressure monitor systems on them and all that. All right, keep your spare tire pressure checked, too. Don't let that thing be flat on you whenever you're needing to change it. Have your tires rotated at every oil change. And pay attention to these wear indicators right here. These wear indicators are really important because they give you an idea. If these are getting level with them, then you need to you need be looking at replacing those tires. Uh, and front tire patterns are different than rear tire patterns. If you go too long without rotating them, 
and you had four new tires to start with, sometimes you'll get a wear pattern that will develop on the back tires that when you move those tires to the front, it'll start sounding like a tractor going down the road. And that's really annoying. I've seen that before, too. Keep an eye on your tread wear indicators, though. But take a time to practice changing a tire on your own vehicle if you can. Uh, if you're a guy and you've got a son or a daughter that's, you know, a teenager, uh, get out there and just take time with them and show them how to use the jack safely and jack it up and and uh, break the lugs loose before you ever jack it up. So and once you just one little turn to break them loose and jack it up, and have them change a tire while you watch to make sure they'll be able to do it. Make sure they do it on a level place. Don't try to jack up a car on a slanted surface and, you know, where the car is able to fall off the jack and all that. And so, But anyway, that's just a really good practice for everybody to know how to change a tire. A lot of your Teslas don't even come with a spare, and the Tesla tires have got to be purchased usually from a Tesla dealer or something like that. So just, you know, whatever. I'm not going to talk a lot about that now. Tires, wheels, and alignment. Don't ever put the donut spare on the front of a front-wheel drive car. You know, it's not really a, uh, good to put it on the rear of a real wheel drive car either. But these little old gears in this differential will go crazy uh, if you've got one tire smaller than the other on the same axle and the differential is in there, you will, on some of your small foreign cars, destroy this transaxle, the differential in this transaxle, if you put the donut on there. So what you're supposed to do, if you've got a flat tire on the front, is jack the car up. And a lot of the times the jack will raise the whole side of the car up. Uh, pull the back tire off, put it on the front, and put the donut on the, the non-drive axle. That's what you're supposed to do. Most people aren't going to go to that trouble. They'll just pop the donut on there and say B-I-H, you know. But you can cause some serious damage like that. So be really careful about putting the donut on a small front-wheel drive car on one side of the front. Because it is, I'm telling you, you'll even hear those gears raising cane in the axle, you know, because they don't usually react with one another except to spin with the whole assembly. And then when you're making a turn, they react with one another. So one wheel can go faster than the other because the outer tire is making a bigger circle. But, boy, if you've got a little tire on one side and a big one on the other side, you're going to make some issues. Uh, pay attention to the low tire pressure message. Now, sometimes it's just because it's cold. Uh, I took this picture of the dash of my Explorer the other day whenever we had a cold snap. And molecular bleed through is going to allow the tires to all go low. All right, so I went ahead and uh, pulled that thing and, uh, you know, pulled my air hose out and fired up my air compressor and checked all my tire pressures and the tires had leaked down to like 25 psi <laughs> so i went ahead and took them up i like to carry mine at about 38 psi you know because they usually i won't have to check them again for a long time now if you're checking them and you find out that you've got 32 32 32 and then 22 one that tire that's got really low air is going to have a leak somewhere a nail or something you need to be paying attention to that but that low tire pressure light is a fe it's federally mandated because, you know, there were crashes that happened because of tires that were low that people weren't paying attention to. And nowadays, you'll see people driving around with tires that are half flat, even though they have tire pressure warning. Now, tire pressure warning indicators, some systems measure tire pressure using sensors strapped to the rim or attached to the tire valve stem. Uh, a few platforms just compare the rolling speed of the tires using a wheel speed sensor. Toyota Solara back in this. 2006 or 7 range did that. Early Ford Windstars did that. They would just look at the wheel speed sensors. A tire that's only half inflated is going to roll faster like it's a smaller wheel, and so it can basically tell which one is low that way. All right. So this right here is your brakes. Right? That uh, was a video that was the tail end of a video one of my students made after he redid the brakes on his Bronco, and he wanted to drive it and slide the wheel. Uh, but Talk a little bit about that. that. Fluid should start brake, going out those lines. Yeah, brake lines wear out, usually more on the front than on the rear. When you're standing on the brake doing a panic stop, those steel brake lines that are carrying the fluid out there and those flexible rubber hoses are having to contain 2,000 pounds of pressure or more. That's a lot. So you, it's really important to know that just how much pressure is out there. Check the brake fluid level in the master cylinder regularly. As the brake pads wear in the front, this fluid will go low because the, the calipers are having to take up some of the fluid that used to be here. And whenever you push those calipers back in there, a lot of the times you'll cause the master cylinder to run over if somebody's added fluid. Now, if you've got a situation where your uh, low brake fluid light comes on and you drive down the road and, uh, you know, you get down there, your engine starts to warm up, and the under hood starts to warm up, and the brake light goes off, and then you're basically going to be looking at low brake fluids. Uh, 
and it's just a little bit low and as it warms up it expands a little bit and it raises that little float up off of its switch in there so if you see brake again if you see a, a red brake light uh, bulb come on when you first start it up you say oh no there's something wrong with my brakes it'll be a low brake fluid and then like i say if you get down to your favorite stop sign and that light goes off and it does that every day you just need to add a little brake fluid typically but pay attention to these lines on this master cylinder and make sure you know uh, that when to stop pouring it in there don't run it over try not to get brake fluid on the paint because it'll damage your paint if you do get brake fluid on the paint wash it off with a hose don't wipe it off because sometimes if you wipe it off some paint will come with it and here's your steering and suspension the suspension has got to support the weight of the vehicle and keep the wheels in line at the same time uh, the top of the strut on the strut suspension is mounted to the vehicle's chassis that lowers the vehicle center of gravity and makes it more stable Brakes. And that thing, you got these, notice these shocks, it's got little oil in there and they got little holes in there so that it takes it all, it all has to got to work to get through those little holes and that basically is a, is a damper thing, is what it amounts to. Uh, wheel alignments, the conditions that allow the vehicle to track down the road a predictable line without you having to fight the wheel to keep it on the road or something. Toe refers to how parallel the two front uh, wheels are in relation to each other when viewed from the top. Uh, camber is the tilt of the wheel away from two, true vertical when viewed from the front. Now, <coughs> typically, if you've got positive camber, it's going to pull in that direction. Uh, and if you've got, you can be within specs, uh, the alignment guy, if he's got it within specs, but it's slightly positive, and then the cast, the caster, which is another uh, adjustment, is slightly negative on that same wheel, but still within specs, it'll pull in that direction too. Uh, but anyway, that's a, that's a, that's about. There's caster. Uh, that's basically the steering axis runs through that spring on this particular one. Usually, it runs through the ball joints. If it's got two ball joints, or if it's got one ball joint and this spring, the, it'll run right through that. And so look, seen from the side, you've got positive caster is whenever that is tilted that way. Negative caster is when it's tilted back. Uh, now, older vehicles that didn't have power steering typically uh, had a setting that was a lot more uh, negative than positive because it made the vehicle easier to steer. Caster does not usually affect tire wear, but it can affect vehicle handling. So looking at your leaks, you got to say, what is it that's leaking? If I see wet stuff under my car... You know, sometimes you'll pull up in a parking lot and you'll see where somebody else's car was leaking and it'll alarm you thinking yours was leaking. Whatever fluid is leaking will typically be low when you check it. If you're suspecting you've got a power steering fluid leak and you look and it's low, you say, well, that must be what it is because everything else is not low. But this is. Now, that it counts on checking your fluid real regularly, too, you know. Engine oil can range from almost clear to really dark if his vehicle's a diesel. If somebody's been having to add a lot of oil, or like if you have, you may see a lot clearer uh, oil on the ground. But if you've been having to add a lot of oil, you know where it's leaking anyway. Transmission fluid may range from this color to really dark red, depending on how many miles the transmission's got on it since it was serviced. Uh, you know, you look at your coolant, know what color your coolant is, and look and see if you see it on the ground. Uh, you will sometimes, when you're running your air conditioner, see clear water dripping out of the evaporator drain. That's not the kiss of death. Usually it'll be over on the right side of the car or toward the center when it's leaking and dripping out of there. And that's just, it's basically like the evaporator in there has got water collected on it like a glass of tea does. And if, if over time it runs out of there uh, whenever the engine runs. Because it, the air conditioner dehumidifies the air inside the vehicle. And that's one of the reasons it helps it make Make it so comfortable. Brake fluid may be from this clear shade to a darker color, um, but you'll usually notice that your brake fluid is going low because there's not a lot of brake fluid in that reservoir. And if you got a brake fluid leak, you're going to see that brake fluid going low, and you may see a red brake light come on too uh, whenever it detects low fluid. Rear axle oil is going to be darker. Uh, this is new oil here, uh, but it, it's going to be thick, although that thickness not, might not be, not be evident if the leak is a minor one. You may just see a spot or two on the pavement. All right, when you're talking to your service advisor, when you're going in for service, realize there is no magic machine. I mean, there's just not. Scan tools are designed to give a technician a window into the system, but the data must be interpreted properly rather than just pulling a code and popping a part on. That's not typically how you do that. No machine can tell a technician which gasket to replace, which bolt to turn, or anything else. <clears throat> now, 
You are a critical source of information. You're not a source of criticism, but <laughs> that you may fit some people. But the information you provide is often the key to getting good service. Be careful to pay attention to what your car is or was doing wrong. Take notes if necessary. If you can find out a pattern, like does it do it whenever it's cold on a wet day, but not whenever it's cold on a dry day, or, you know, this kind of thing, just write that down on a little sticky note uh, while you're stopped and in a safe place to make sure that you're given as good information as you possibly can, because the more information you give them, the less likely they are to misfire on the repair. Uh, when the problem happens, how often it happens, and be accurate unless you want to confuse the technician. Don't say the problem happens all the time. I don't. When I was a technician, I get so irritated when the customer they don't want to process a question like how often does it happen. They just say all the time, all the time, all the time, and then you drive the car as a mechanic and you can't get it to do it at all, and that's confusing because it would have been easier to deal with if they just said it does it after I've driven it 10 miles and I stop and then I take off again or something like that. You know more what to do. A similar conditions window is what you call that. <clears throat> anyway, all the time is not a good thing to say when it's not doing it all the time. So is it cold engine, hot engine, after parking for a short time, after parking for an hour, wet weather, foggy weather, cold ambient temperature, hot, while cruising, accelerating, or at idle, so on and so forth. Have you changed gasolines lately? Uh, it tickles me to think about this guy one time that was working in the next service bay, and he was a guy I had trained. And he had a Bronco that had almost no miles on it, big Bronco. And this was back when big Broncos were, you know, there still in brand new. And uh, this thing would stumble and pop and snort and cut out whenever it was cold. And he worked with it and he cleaned the injectors. He checked this, he checked that. He was looking at the ignition time and he was looking at everything. And it still, every time he let it cool off, it would not run right when it was cold. It would just pop and snort and cut out. And so uh, he ran out of ideas and he came over and asked me about it. And I said, I want you to go out there and I want you to get the customer because the customer was waiting. I says, talk to the customer and say, can you tell me what kind of gas you're putting in this thing? Don't ask anything beyond that. Let them tell you. And I said, I would just about lay money on the fact that they are using premium gas and this thing is tuned for 87 octane. And so he goes out there and he asks, like, oh, we're using 93 octane, best gas we can put in it. And, uh, and he was done then. He says, well, okay, this is what you need to do. Drive this out of there and put 87 octane back in and this problem will go away. And he did. Uh, and they did. I mean, the problem went away when they went back to 87 octane because 87 octane, believe it or not, burns faster than 93 octane. 90 oct 93 octane is a slower burning gas. And it can cause issues because if it doesn't all burn up, some of it's going to stay on the combustion chamber on the piston and then the top of the, on the head. And it's eventually going to start caking carbon up in there. And then it'll get to where it's increased the compression. It'll start pinging and labor knocking and all that kind of thing. And then you'll have to use premium all the time. And then things get worse and worse. All right. Uh, no crank either. If you've got a start concern. No crank means it clicks or doesn't do anything. Hard start means it spins over, but it takes a long time to start. No start means it cranks normally but won't start. Say if you go over and say, my car won't crank then you're, not ba you're basically giving them bad information there because if it spins over but won't fire up, you know, no crank means when you turn the key, you either either clicks or nothing happens, the engine doesn't move, right? All right, slow to return to idle. Idle speed remains higher than normal, longer than it should when coming to a stop or it stays up there without coming down at all. Rolling idle is whenever you're sitting there and it's going boom, boom, going up and down. Fast idle is when it's higher than normal and stays there most all the time, which is almost the same as the other. Stalls, quits on idle acceleration, deceleration, or cruise. You need to find out, when, ask them, you know, have, when does it do this? Or, uh, losing power, you know, is another thing. Uh, if it stops running while driving, make sure you tell them when it happens and how often it happens and under what circumstances. This one lady one time was telling me that sometimes she'd be sitting there in her uh, her van and it would uh, surge forward without warning and she'd almost hit the car in front of her. And I says, uh, whenever you fill up the gas tank, do you pack the gas tank? She goes, yeah, I always pack it. I get as much fuel in there as I can. I said, well, quit doing that. And because if you pack it, you get some uh, saturation in the canister. And, then, uh, and these newer vehicles, they don't just purge a canister when you're driving. They purge the canister any time they may decide to when you're sitting there idling. And if it's trying to purge a canister and it slugs everything, the engine almost stalls, the idle speed control picks up or the throttle plate or whatever, it can surge forward because the root of it is you packing the gas tank. So let it click off 
whenever and just you know pay the odd number of pennies or whatever um, also if you've got one that when you gas it up if it's hard to start after you gas it up that's going to be a purge valve uh, if it misses on idle acceleration or cruise this is like runs rough and it happens intermittently with a notable loss of power. If you're feeling a bite, uh, then you're basically you're going to be you're looking at an ignition problem of some kind. Buck, jerk, refers to a sudden loss of power that returns just after just a moment and tries to jerk a crick in your neck. And then you got your hesitation stumble. Car falls on its face when applying the throttle either from a dead standstill or when attempting to pick up speed. Suddenly, you got a surge. Uh, which is uneven power at a steady throttle angle and speed when you're attempting to accelerate smoothly. If it's you know coming and going and you're not moving the throttle, making it do that. Backfiring can occur in the exhaust or back through the intake, and be clear about when the backfiring occurs and where it sounds like it's coming from. Uh, you know, usually the mechanic can duplicate that. Um, lack loss of power. Uh, which is poor performance, less power than expected, you know, which would be like if you got a, a fuel filter will typically cause a problem when you're passing a car and it feels like you're losing power whenever you should be at the top of your game there. You know, that'll be, but a fuel filter is not going to keep it from starting or make it do things, you know, at a lower uh, intensity of speed or power. Uh, spark knock is a pinging noise. It's described as valve rattle, but it ain't got nothing to do with the valves. The combustion mix is exploding earlier than it should, and it causes the pistons to make a rattling or a pinging noise. Shutter, chatter, which would be brake operation that occurs with a machine gun-like feeling when the brakes are applied. Uh, sometimes when you're driving one of these automatic transmission vehicles that has the uh, modulated or torque converter, you'll feel it doing a little bit of a chatter when you're not even touching the brake, and that typically means you need a transmission service because the friction modifiers are broken down into fluid. Pulsation is similar to a shutter, but at a lower frequency, usually felt through the pedal when you're stopping, it'll go whoa, 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 whoa. A low spongy pedal, pedal travels farther than it should when the brakes are applied and or feel soft instead of firm. Hard pedal would be harder than normal pedal feel uh, that you're just, you, know, you can tell right away if you're not used to that. Uh, scrubbing, squealing, popping noise, brake fade, the brakes that lose their stopping power when reducing vehicle speed rapidly after high speed driving. That's something a lot of people will experience if they're trying to stop too fast after they've been driving too fast. Warning indicators related to brakes through the ABS red uh, and red brake warning lights. I talked about those earlier. Uh, can mean the fluid is low uh, or part of the brake system is not functioning. That light will prove out when the key is turned on to the start position on most cars. And uh, park brake concerns, or it's either inoperative, low pedal, won't release, or warning indicator concerns. A lot of vehicles nowadays have got electric park brakes, and that's a whole bunch of different uh, stuff going on there. Steering and handling, you got free play in the steering wheel. That's important to talk about that. Pull, wander, or sometimes, you know, these little U-joints that are in the steering column will get stiff on some of these little foreign cars, and it, the steering will feel funny because of that. You'll have to replace that uh, that part of the steering column. Shimmy is a tooth shattering vibration that jiggles the steering wheel at certain speeds or after braking. It can be extreme to the point of being dangerous. Memory steer means when the vehicle tends to pull in the same direction as the last turn rather than return into the center. It's rare, but it happens. Torque steer is when a vehicle pulls to one side on hard acceleration. That's on higher powered front wheel drive cars with two different axle lengths, you'll see that. You know, torque steer is not usually something you can do anything about. Upshift concerns, if the transmission shifts prop improperly when accelerating to road speed, rough, late, or not at all. Downshift concerns, uh, when it shifts, uh, downshifts improperly coming to a stop, either rough, late, or not at all. Uh, if it engages harshly when you put it in gear, boom, you know, slams, or if you change from forward to reverse. Uh, leaks are self-explanatory. Uh, indicators like overdrive or transmission warning light flashing or illuminating when it shouldn't be. And you've got shift lever or linkage concern. If you've got a shifter uh, situation where when you put one in park, it won't stay in park but may try to roll away, that is something you need to stop driving that car until you're absolutely sure that won't happen because that car can go away. It can, if you're parking on a slide in kind and you thought you had it in park, but something's wrong with the shift linkage so that it comes out of park, it can roll down the hill and kill somebody. So do not ignore that and don't feel like it'll be all right. If you put it, if you ever put one in park and you know you've got the gear, the gear in park, but it's still trying to roll even though it's in park, that needs immediate attention. Uh, clutch concerns, 
and that was talking to automatic transmission, by the way, and this is a manual transmission slide, so I apologize for that. Clutch concerns, transmission goes into gear but won't pull off, transmission won't go into gear, pedal is hard or low, fluid leaks, get them fixed or you'll destroy the transmission. Axle concerns, whining or roaring, it may change with acceleration or deceleration, clunking and so on from the rear wheel drive. Computers and check engine light stuff here. Check engine light doesn't mean you need to open the hood and check your engine, although that might not be a bad idea from time to time. Uh, it generally means the PCM powertrain control module has detected emissions related concern that may or may not be causing a problem the driver can feel. Hundreds of different problems can cause the PCM to illuminate the mill. Now, if you put off fixing a known concern because you know what that is or you think you know what it is, a bunch of other concerns will pile up behind that check engine light and you'll wind up being surprised by a whole bunch of repairs it needed to do and you didn't know about until it started running bad. And, you know, might start with, you may say, well, all I got is a intake air temperature sensor code, and I know what that is, so I'm not worried about it. And then later on, when it starts running bad, a year or two later, you go in and say about five or six things wrong that you didn't know about because the check engine light's been on the whole time. All right. So problem's not always something that needs immediate attention, but for the engine that runs too cold can cause it to illuminate the mill. That needs fixing to avoid engine sludge and fuel economy reduction, but a loose fuel filler cap can cause an MIL on newer vehicles. Now, so check your gas cap if the light comes on right after refueling. A lot of these vehicles now don't even have a gas cap on them. You just poke this little uh, nozzle right on in there, you know. A flashing mill means, that, in other words, check engine light, means the PCM has detected a misfire condition severe enough to damage the catalytic converter. Most of these vehicles nowadays these will turn off the injector on the misfiring cylinder. Uh, but they're still concerned there might be a problem that's liable to damage that really expensive catalytic converter, and it's covered for 80,000 miles, you know. So don't drive it any farther than you absolutely need to if that light starts flashing. That's really important. Every vehicle should have its own bank account. You need to plan for scheduled maintenance, uh, oil change, transmission service, coolant change, brakes, and this is going to vary from car to car. Belts and hoses, spark plugs, etc. You see, the, you get the point. Uh, some things that shops might try to upsell would be uh, injector and upper intake cleaning on MPI vehicles. GDI platforms might need intake valve cleaning, so that's a slightly different deal. Power steering fluid flush, you can have this done, but usually it's not needed. I mean, you know, it's nice to have clean fluid in there, but, you know, typically uh, if they're trying to sell you something, you need to say, well, can you show me in the maintenance schedule for this vehicle what the interval is where this is supposed to be done. Now, believe it or not, there are some vehicles that require brake fluid replacement, but most of them do not. But you can get one of those fast car uh, dip strips, you know, Phoenix uh, Corporation makes those, and you can basically, they're, they, they you, I think they come about 70 to a bottle and it costs about a dollar a piece. <laughs> But the shop is a good idea to dip that in there and see if they turned really, really purple. So FASTCAR stands for Fluid Analysis by Stimulation of Copper Alpha Reactions. And the their fluid, brake fluid typically gets contaminated with copper. Uh, you can also measure the voltage of the brake fluid, believe it or not. It ought, ought to be over 0 0.30 volt, 30 volts. Those are three-tenths of a volt. Uh, when you dip that uh, positive terminal uh, in the fluid and you hold the negative terminal on the uh, brake if you, I mean, on the, uh, not the brake, on the uh, negative battery terminal, you ought to see uh, not very much voltage in that fluid at all because if you've got moisture in the fluid, you're going to wind up seeing that. Well, this video has been a little bit over an hour. I'm going to go ahead and uh, be done with this, and I hope you got enough information out of it. Uh, it's elementary. This is not for mechanics. It's more for just car owners. And uh, give me some comments. Let me know how I did, and I'll talk to you guys later.